is not good that man should be alone. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill me with a word desperately needed to sustain life. And let me speak in the name of God, the Father and Mother of us all. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Do any of y'all like hummus? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's good. Either way, it's good. Because in a moment, I'm going to make a connection between hummus, the season of creation, which we just finished celebrating, and our walk in love pledge drive, which starts today. Hang tight for that, okay? But before I do that, we've got to deal with some thorny scriptures this morning. I once had a seminary professor say that if you wanted to check out a congregation, go on the Sunday when Mark 10 is the assigned gospel reading. (laughs) It's almost impossible to read this story of Jesus debating the religious elite and not cringe. We cringe for a whole lot of reasons. At least one of those reasons being that this passage has been abused by the Christian church for centuries. When the religious leaders try to catch Jesus in a pedantic and technical legal trap, Jesus says, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. It's because of our fallenness, our inability to love each other well, that prescriptions and laws regarding relationships are codified. It should be noted and said often that the church throughout history has misused, misinterpreted, and wielded this passage of Mark's gospel to hurt, harm, and repress people, most of them women. This sinful history of the church is yet another example of the fact that we fail to love each other as God intends. We do not choose to love as God chooses to love. We do not always follow the path of love that leads to freedom. Ironically, this mistreatment is exactly what Jesus is teaching against. See, Jesus is always on the side of the vulnerable. And he was trying to get these powerful men in this room to look beyond their inward-facing self-interests and live in outward favor of the powerless. Yet historically, the church has used this passage to overwhelmingly favor men to the disadvantage of women and children. Fortunately, we've come a long way in recognizing that sometimes Things do not work out. And for mental, spiritual, and physical safety, all kinds of relationships, including marriages, sometimes have to end. To put this more clearly, let me quote my friend, Reverend Allison English. She's going to preach this morning. It's important to say that if any of you are thinking of leaving a toxic marriage where one or both parties are not keeping their vows to love, honor, and cherish, rest assured, Jesus is on your side. Now, truth be told, the story of creation that we heard this morning and Psalm 8, which we prayed this morning, are no less thorny, if less obviously so. Often, throughout our lives, we are taught that we are not only created in God's image, but that we have dominion, here dominance, over creation. However, biblical scholar and professor at Case Western University, Dr. Timothy Beale, notes that, quote, these verses, the creation story and Psalm 8, are the entire biblical basis for our grand narrative of godlike dominion and human exceptionalism. 
in the Western world, since the time of the Enlightenment, we have used these scant verses to place ourselves above creation, to place ourselves somehow independent of and separate from creation. In doing so, we've ignored the overwhelming and repeated testimony of Scripture that calls us to live interdependent lives, not only with each other, but with all of creation. Our theology of human exceptionalism feeds our myth of individuality and our delusion of control. It nurtures within us the notion that we do not need others and that we are masters of our own destiny and that we can somehow bend reality to our favor. And I'm not speaking of other Christian traditions here. We find evidence of, the, of this theology in our own liturgy. Y'all, I love Eucharistic prayer C. I love it. The line, deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal, is beautiful. It's extremely important for us to pray. However, it also has the lines, from the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill, you made us the rulers of creation. This is a proclamation of human exceptionalism, which, as I noted, has slim biblical justification. Now, y'all take a deep breath. I'm stepping out on a limb and sharing with you the very edge of what challenges me to grow right now. I'm describing my next step on the journey of faith in order to invite you to come along. There are profound theological and behavioral implications for considering ourselves part of creation instead of above it. I invite you to explore those implications with me in a faithful journey of mutual discovery. Now, what does all this have to do with hummus and the pledge drive? <laughs> Have you ever noticed the similarity between the words hummus, humility, and human? That's because they all share the same semantic root, which means earth, or more specifically, the ground. Hummus is basically really tasty mud. <laughs> Humans are simply animated mud. To practice humility, to be humble, is to embrace that we are part of the dirt, not lords above it. We hear this in common expressions such as, they are so down to earth, and they are really grounded. And in our religious tradition, every Ash Wednesday, we dramatically remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Now, y'all, breaking the illusion of dominion, shedding our misconception of control, is hard. One of the strongest forces that convinces us we are masters of our own destiny is money. Money is a spiritual force that deludes us into thinking not only can we make the world into what we want it to be, but that we don't need anybody else along the way. It gives us a false sense of power and self-sufficiency that prevents us from living into God's interdependent kingdom. A profound way, a profound way, of overcoming the power money can have on us and the delusion it feeds is to give it away. This is where the pledge drive is a helpful spiritual practice. Making offerings to God 
is a path to freedom. The scriptures say that the truth will set us free. And the truth is, we are not self-sufficient. We need each other. We are part of creation. We need creation. This glorious earth is not our vassal or servant, rather our partner in life. Making offerings to God not only proclaims this truth, but enables us to incarnate the reality of our interdependence and our kinship with all of creation. But you don't have to take my word for it. Over the next few weeks, in place of the epistle reading, you'll be hearing from trusted members of the congregation offering their testimony. They'll share stories of experiencing God's unconditional, transformational love right here through St. Patrick's. They will reflect on how these experiences have helped them walk in love as Christ loves them. And they will join me in asking you to make a commitment to God through St. Patrick's for 2025. Not only will your offerings support abundant worship and ministry, not only will they keep the lights on, quite literally, they will also set you on a path, set us all on a path to freedom. So my brothers, my sisters, my non-binary family as well, I invite you to come with me on this journey as we continue to discover how to live not inwardly, toward our selfish interests, rather outwardly, favoring the vulnerable and in partnership with creation. Y'all, the Holy Spirit is up to something in this place. So let's join with the Spirit and walk in love. Amen.